Hello, this is West Virginia Tim. Today I'm going to show you an example of a smart cache. Smart caches are the new hot thing in gadget cache creation. This is going to be an introduction on building a smart cache. I'm going to show you this one, but more importantly, I'm going to give you an overview of what it takes to make one. This is not a how-to video, but more of an introduction to the concept of what you would need to do if you decided to start building smart caches. So my, understand, my intention is not trying to convince you to do this, but only to share with you of some of what is required to build a smart cache. We all know gadget cache is a cache that you gotta do something to be able to access the log. It's a field puzzle. Well, a smart cache is a gadget cache that you have to do something, but there's a microprocessor inside making it smart. So it's interacting with you and you're interacting with it. It's a smart gadget cache. So this smart cache is going to tell us to do something very challenging. And because it's smart, it's going to know if we did it right and if we did it wrong. And if we do it wrong, we're going to get this red light. And it's also going to tell us down here, and we heard a buzzer. So a smart cache interacts with you a whole bunch of different ways. But before we get started, we're going to have to go into the house because that's where all smart caches start, at the computer. So let's head inside. To make a smart cache, you're going to need a microprocessor of some sort. The most notable is called an Arduino, but there are various vendors that make nearly the exact same thing a little less expensive. I use one from SunFounder. This Arduino, the one I have right here in my hand, costs about $22. From SunFounder, it's about $15. There are various sizes, and depending on what your application, you'll use different sizes. They can be this small. This is a microprocessor. They also can be this big. This is a mega with a lot of memory and a lot more inputs and outputs. Now, don't glaze over, but let me tell you what these things are. These are a computer processor on a micro trip chip. The Arduino, here's the good news, it's an open source device used for building things that can sense and control physical devices. Hey, does that sound like a geocache? This little thing has 14 digital input and output pins, and over here you'll see analog, and it has six analog inputs. It's also got a USB connection uh, right here. And it... Okay, that's enough of the technical jargon. Now let me put it in West Virginian for it. These things can do thousands of things. There are hundreds and hundreds of sensors. And by connecting the correct sensor, you can make your cache do about anything. In Berkeley County, I actually have a smart gadget geotrail which you can earn a coin, it's called Smart Gadgets of Berkeley County. Um, about 12 of those caches are microprocessor-based caches. Let me tell you some of the things you're going to find on that trail. You're going to come to a birdhouse that has a temperature probe, and you have to raise the temperature by 30 degrees, and then you have to lower the temperature on the probe by 20 degrees. How about a cache that has a a little altitude sensor uh, connected to the microprocessor and it's at the base of a tower and you have to increase your altitude by 100 feet um, and if you don't want to climb the tower of course you can go down the hill and change your altitude by 100 feet but there's a timer on it so you have to do it within 10 seconds within 10 minutes how about a, a cache that you have to shine a light in it how about a cache where you have two birdhouses and they talk to each other and so it takes teamwork, and so you have to do something at each cache at the same time to get the coordinates to the final. The one that we heard about several years ago, one of the first microprocessor-based uh, smart gadget caches, was a reverse geocache. On the smart caches of Berkeley County, you're going to find a smart geocache, and, you're going and the cache has a, a GPS chip, and you have to walk around to certain areas to be able to claim the find for the cache. Uh, how about a cache that uh, senses your knock? Or how about a cache that asks you questions? The sky's the limit on what you can do 
with smart gadget caches using microprocessor based technology. Now back to earth, let's talk about how to do that. Like any computer, it has to be programmed. The programming language for these microprocessors are C++. There's good news. First, the good news. It's an open source product. So the code is free and there are lots of sites, including a lot of geocachers who share their code. And it's available online with a little bit of searching. So the good news is there's help out there. Now the bad news. I find that learning C++ is really difficult. Well, how in the world do I have 12 smart caches? I teamed up with someone. My someone's name is TH10GT. Olaf lives in Germany, speaks perfect English, and is my cache creator partner. He's the programming genius, and I have the building skills. So together, we make a great team and have developed a great friendship through our love of creative cache creation. Our smart caches are a collaborative effort between two friends. Maybe you can find an Olaf. Maybe you can learn some basic C++ programming, but you are going to need to be able to code these little boogers. Now, how did I get started? I got started by buying a beginner's kit, and I suggest buying one from SunFounder or SparkFun. And you're gonna pay about $50, $75 Make sure it has a book and start playing. Read it and play. The only way to dip your toe in the water is to get started. And of course, the question you're probably wondering is, is it expensive? Uh, uh, yes, it is. <laughs> uh, to be honest with you, the um, microprocessor boards, the small ones, are under $10. Uh, even the largest ones you can buy are only 20. So that in itself, you know, won't break the bank. But you don't need just a microprocessor. You're, this is actually a geocache right here. You're going to need a breadboard uh, to connect it to. And then, of course, you can tell you're going to need a lot of wires, so you're going to have to buy wires. Uh, of course, as soon as you start connecting things like lights, you're going to need... Uh, possibly a box of different resistors. Um, your sensors aren't that expensive. Um, some sensors are as cheap as uh, two or three dollars. Uh, some sensors might cost you ten or fifteen dollars. Uh, so by the time you buy your microprocessor and your breadboard, you might possibly need an LCD readout. Uh, you're going to buy resistors. You're going to buy wire. Um, when you put the whole picture together, it can be expensive. Uh, the actual true cost of a smart cache, the inside of a smart cache, is probably, you know, $30, $40. But the problem is you can't buy exactly what you need. you got to buy more than you need. And that suggests that you never have a problem. And you're very likely going to need uh, to, to do redos. So, yes, it can be expensive. There are so many di different ways to get started. First, of course, you got to come up with your concept, buy your supplies. Then you can. There's a couple different options. One, you can go ahead, plug your uh, Arduino right into your computer. It'll power up. Uh, you use your Arduino free app and you start your programming. This is actually what a program looks like after it's done. Um, and then you can program it, or you can get your concept, buy your supplies, and then you can actually build a prototype like I've done here. So you put your, your wires together, you might have an LCD board, you connect your sensors, and you do it that way. Uh, and then, of course, after you do that, you test the heck out of it, and you make sure it's perfect. Now, what I've just told you in the last five, 10 seconds has taken just a little bit of time, but it's hours and hours worth of work. But after it's done and it's perfect, then you just gotta figure out what you've gotta do to take this and place it into a cache depending on how big this is and how complex and how your sensors operate and what it's going to look like will depend on your cache size and your cache type um, but when it works perfectly then you get to head back out to your shop and build this into a cache so this is really really high level um, but now let's go back out to the part that i enjoy the fun part and let's go back out to the shop and let's look at a smart cache Welcome back to my shop. When I filmed this, this cache is not active yet, so that's why we're in here. 
When you walk up to this cache, I wanted it to look like an old gray mechanical box. There is uh, a very heavy duty latch over here at the side with an exterior lock. But before I open this, I don't want to scare you. All uh, smart caches aren't this big. This is the biggest cache I've ever made. So smart caches can be very, very small. Most of, most of the rest of mine fit into birdhouses, but this application warranted a size this big. Okay, we open it. Cache page tells us to bring four AA batteries. So I place my four AA batteries, and uh, if you'll notice, um, there's the name of the cache, Travel West Virginia, uh, by Tim and my friend Olaf that we talked about inside. This is a sheet of plexiglass. And um, if you'll notice just inside what we talked about, there's a, there's a, um, uh, our microprocessor back here in the back. There's a breadboard where all the connections are made. Uh, there's a speaker back here that you can see. And then there's a wire that comes over here to a, a servo. And this is a cash release mechanism. I have a whole video talking about how to build this and it comes out the bottom and if you look at the bottom the only thing there is is a little hole and you can put your fingers up there but can't can't feel anything what it tells you to do is to take this wand and move this around what is the shape of the state of west virginia without touching this metal and when you do and you get back over here and touch this you win and so right now uh, the smart cache is telling me please start the game by touching the smart green with the handle. So when I do that, all I do is touch the green and then I come back down here and notice there's a timer. So I only have one minute and 45 seconds to do that. So let me just w tell you, and I've got a green light. So I also got a visual. Uh, should I make a mistake? Let's make a mistake first. Should I make a mistake, you'll hear it, and you'll also hear a sound. It gives me a red light, and it says, sorry, you lost, and then asks me to start over again. So I can come back here, I touch my button again, and when I do that, it's going to start a new timer, and I get my green light, and I get to go again. So now I'm going to set this camera down. Now let me tell you, this might not look hard, but this is the beauty of filming because I'll probably have to try this about 10 times uh, to get around uh, the state of West Virginia. But uh, I can fast forward you through that section. Okay, time's running out, but I'm almost there. Keep your eyes on the light, the LCD screen, and the servo motor. I did it. Five seconds to spare. Now watch the servo motor. Look at that. Dropped right down in my hand. There's our, there's, our, um, there's our log. And to put it back, I'm just going to go ahead and show you. To put it back, all i got to do is just shove it back up in here and give it a little push, and it latches. This is really amazing. I can't take credit for this idea. This is Eric Kristoff's idea. Uh, his geocaching name is Holliston. So um, I'll put his name right here. Well, what do you think of the, the world of smart gadget caches? Fairly amazing, isn't it? The thing that makes it so amazing is the cache interacts with you. We've come a long way from Tupperware in the woods. This is where I'm saying the, the future of gadget caches is this direction. But I tell you, programming those microprocessors, that's a challenge. So you're either going to have to team with somebody or you're going to have to learn some C++. But hopefully we got your mind thinking. And think about microprocessors. Go online and look at some of the sensors available. The sky's the limit on these smart caches. But I'll be honest with you, they're not for everybody. They're expensive. And gadget caches are always going to be fabulous. They're always going to be around. So you don't have to go to smart gadget caches to create some great caches. But let's work together at raising the geocaching bar by improving our caches one geocache at a time. This is West Virginia Tim, and thanks for watching.